I think that I find that through the folk arts, I don't really know the dictionary definition of folk arts, but my understanding is just from having been here at the National Heritage Awards in 1990, was that uh, all of the artists that I met represent a tradition that is passed down from generation to generation. And so in the process of going from generation to generation, why then there's a refinement process that, that occurs in that I think that over time, these folk traditions, these folk arts, they tend to accentuate universal themes. And so uh, I find that most of them really showcase the nobility of the human spirit. That is Lakota flute player, hoop dancer, and 1990 National Heritage Fellow, Kevin Locke. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Kevin Locke has spent much of his life learning, preserving, and sharing the traditions of his people. Although he only learned the Lakota language as a young adult in the early 1970s, Kevin was nonetheless raised in the traditions and values of the Lakota people. A master flute player, he is acknowledged to have been the pivotal force in the now powerful revival of the indigenous flute tradition, which was literally on the brink of extinction. He learned the Sioux hoop dance, another traditional practice that almost had died out. The hoop dance is stunning. In it, Kevin uses 28 wooden hoops to create a series of designs and patterns, from flowers to orbs. But the hoop dance is not just a visual delight. The hoop represents unity, and the dance is an expression of the oneness of humankind. A born teacher, Kevin Locke brings these Lakota traditions to the classroom, not merely demonstrating the flute and the hoop dance around the country and around the world, but actively teaching them to students. Kevin Locke has recorded some 12 CDs of music and stories. He's performed in more than 80 countries, serving as a cultural ambassador for the United States Information Service since 1980. Yet despite his renown and great success, Kevin Locke sees himself first and foremost as a communicator rather than an artist. Uh, when I do presentations, I don't think of it at all as entertainment. Nothing, nothing related to entertainment is purely an opportunity to encourage people to, um, I would say, focus on universal themes like the oneness of humankind, the uh, shared nobility of the human spirit. And I found, just through uh, doing what I do, that it's the perfect opportunity to educate and to communicate these themes to the public. And I think that this is a wonderful way, especially to reach young people, because you don't you don't have to hit it from an intellectual basis at all. You can just cut to the quick, and you sh you share with them the material, and I, it just speaks to them in that way. I find it very interesting because I think one thing, among many, that defines folk art is mm -hmm. its distinctiveness, mm -hmm. and yet it's really through that distinctiveness that mm -hmm. you can come to the universality you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas speaking broadly with, mm -hmm. with popular or, or mass culture, mm -hmm. it's really all about sameness. Oh, yeah. Of course, there is something about like six or 7,000 different ethnicities on the planet. So each one of them has very unique ways of expressing themselves through, you know, music or dance or whatever it is. But it's just that we all live in this world of color, this world of beauty, world of sound, world of, you know, like growth and everything. So we all, ha we all have this natural impulse to create sound, to create movement. And so I think the folk arts, it's, it's really at this, this universal level. It just expresses the joy of being human, no matter where we are, Arctic, tropics, temperate, wherever we are. Well, you've performed given presentations mm -hmm. all, all around the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the expression of mm -hmm. reception can change depending on where you are. But you find that people can absolutely relate to what you do and yes. what you're presenting. Yeah, I've been to, I think I've performed, I counted a uh, little over 80 countries now, 80 countries. So that's what I find that no matter, I don't have to really explain much, although it, it, it helps in places where language is not a barrier. But people can naturally relate 
to the the presentation because of the of the the universal aspect of it. Your mother was an activist. Yeah. And she was a MacArthur fellow. Yes. Yet you had to teach yourself as an adult, a young adult, you had to teach yourself Lakota. Yes. Why? Why was it not spoken at home? Well, it was just that both my parents only could speak English. So I just grew up from childhood with just English. But then when I got to be about, I'd say, 14 or 15 years of age, then just in the area around where I was living there in South Dakota, then I just thought, well, I'm missing out on so much. I just don't think that the the mindset was such at that time was such that it was included this idea of being multicultural or multilingual. And I think that the general mindset, especially with the with the Lakota language, I suppose other tribal languages here in North America, was that it was just something that had to go, had to disappear, had to be marginalized, had to be excluded. Well, I was really surprised you taught yourself in the 1970s. Yeah. And it was illegal still at that point. Yeah, pretty much. You know, everything was so suppressed. And, of course, in the uh, federal edicts and laws, everything was, of course, officially banned and outlawed. You know, devotional practices and language as well. When you decided you were going to teach yourself Lakota, Mm -hmm. how did you go about doing that if your parents didn't speak it? And it was a language that was so actively repressed. How were you able to, to learn? Well, in the 70s, I'd say late 60s, early 70s, then there were a lot of people, you know, who grew up only speaking that. There were so many people who were monolingual, only could speak Lakota or Dakota language. So even though the government was actively repressing it, they were not totally successful. And and so there was still such a high percentage of people that was their only means of communication. So those are the people that I wanted to communicate with. And then my, my mom's uncle was pretty much monolingual in Lakota. So I, I would just associate with him. I think we, we still have something between six and 10,000 native speakers of Lakota. So it's pretty high population yet. And you taught yourself the flute. Yes. And from what I understand, the time that you taught yourself, there was, they thought, one other practitioner? Just a few. There were just a few practitioners. I was Going to school at the uh, Black Hill State University, then it was called Black Hill State College in Spearfish, and we went down to Vermilion, University of South Dakota. I believe that was in the fall of 72, 1972, and uh, I was a, my freshman year in college. And there was a gentleman there who I'd seen before but never met. He was born in the 1870s. He was like in his upper 90s when I, at this time in 1972. But he was still very healthy, very dynamic, and he was like one of the main practitioners of that tradition or the genre of music. The the songs uh, originated as vocal compositions, and they're they're played on the flute. And so he was doing a presentation there at this big conference. And so he finished his presentation, and I waited till everybody left, and I wanted to go over there and see because he was such an artisan, the way he'd decorate, the way he'd embellish his instruments. They were really works of art, even besides sounding beautiful. And so then... uh, I went over there and I was admiring his work and then I wanted to get his ear so I asked him if anybody was playing the flute or doing this. He said, no, nobody's interested in this. Then I said, well, what about your family, maybe your kids or grandkids? He said, no, no, none of them are are interested in this at all. And then I just kind of offhandedly, I said, oh, that's too bad. Seems like somebody should carry this on. Then he was doing something, he's putting stuff away, he just put everything down, he stopped and he was silent for a while. He looked at me and says, yes. He says, you, he says, you can do it. You're the one that should do this. What did you do? How did you respond? I just kind of ignored it. I just brushed it aside. And uh, I didn't really say anything. We didn't have any further conversation. But sometime after that, I heard that he had passed away. I was at my mom's place. And, you know, he used to make flutes. And he'd sell beautiful flutes. He'd sell them for like $15, $20. Now they're worth thousands of dollars if people can get them. But my mom had a couple of his flutes. So she went back and she, to her room and she came back and she brought one of them out. She, she handed it to me. And so I was trying to get some kind of sound out of it. And then um, I handed it back to her. She said, no, no. She said, no, you just keep that. You keep that. But how did you learn how to actually play the flute? My mom did have these old recording. It was from like the 30s. It was from the Library of Congress. And those selections on that recording, that Library of Congress recording, are like the main 
best recordings of uh, traditional flute music. And so I listened to those, those two songs, and those are my first two songs, you see. And then from there, I just found a lot of people around, older people, who knew those songs. So those are the songs that I, I collected and became my repertoire. And you would just ask them to hum, and you would play along with the flute. No, until no, you they got it? they sing them. There were no flute players when I started, but you know I I knew how it was supposed to go because I'd been around. His name was Richard Foolbull, that flute player, and there were others just at that time who died all about the same time. So I heard them. I knew, I knew how to take the vocal compositions and to translate them or instrumentalize them on the flute. Any of the singers at that time during the seventies, the older generation singers, they all knew those songs. They're called love songs, but they're not all about love. They explore all the themes that you hear like on popular music, whether it's opera or country western, whatever. They're people are brokenhearted, uh, unrequited love. So many of them are about people who are romantically challenged, these kind of songs. And so everybody had a stock of those songs, but they're very unique compositionally. They're much like haiku because they follow a formula. It's a very strict formula, compositional rule. So it, Usually one phrase, very cryptic, they'll repeat it three times in the beginning of the song, and then the melody will change quite drastically, and then the second part of the song, it'll like expose or shine a light and give meaning to the first cryptic part of the song. And the song ends with the repetition of that first cryptic opening. So they're very uh, formulaic, so much so that you can easily identify those songs when you hear them. It's like a poetic form that a literary form which is so unique and really widespread throughout many regions of North America. That tradition so bespeaks the social life of the pre-reservation days, the rules of uh, interaction, because at that time, years ago, I think young people, they could interact freely, but then when they reach probably puberty, then they separate them according to genders because they have to go through their gender-specific training to acquire the subsistence skills because it's no joke living out in that area like goes down 30, 40 below in the winter. You got to be sharp. You have to know what you're doing. So they have to learn those skills before they're eligible for marriage. But then in the meantime, those social skills are not developed. So then this genre of music became the medium through which they express themselves. You see, that's how, how that came about. So see, even in the uh, early reservation times, there were so many of songs in that genre that they just they just continued on. Is that pretty distinctive to the Northern Plains culture? No. The rules of composition are diffused throughout a wide region. So all the Great Lakes people, they have the same compositional rules for that genre, even down to Oklahoma. And the, and the flutes that they make are in the kind of like a, a step off of a diatonic scale. It's a step off of a diatonic scale. So you could get Kiowa flutes, Comanche flutes from uh, Ponca from Oklahoma, and they'd be on the same scale as like Menominee, Ojibwe, or Meskwaki, or Ho-Chunk from the Great Lakes. So they could all play the songs on flutes crafted in these very different widespread areas. Dance is something that in Native American culture has quite a different meaning than in European culture. I think so. Can you explain? I kind of, I like, maybe I just exaggerate to make the point, but I'll just say the dominant culture. You know, that I always think that in the dominant culture, music and dance are, are, are what I would say are superfluous activities. They're, they're extraneous. They're not intrinsic activities. Whereas in, uh, in most indigenous cultures throughout the world, music and dance are obligatory activities. They're obligatory. You have to participate. And so that's the difference right there. And I always think that in many cases... For indigenous cultures that I've observed, the use of music and dance is quite different because, you know, you, you drive around, you watch people, they're plugged into their little earphones and they're in their cars and they're just zoned out. They have stressful, routine lives and they want to, they want to just escape all that, you see. So then they tune into music or whatever and it kind of gives them a release and they just ex escape that reality that they're in, you see. Whereas I find that indigenous people, especially here in North America, they use music for the opposite purpose, you see. We use it to connect with that which is real and good, that which is holy, that which enables all these barriers to collapse and to dissipate. The barrier between ourselves and our ancestors, that disappears, you know, through music. There's a continuity there. The barrier between ourselves and the future, that all disappears. 
the disconnect between ourselves and nature, we reverse that and we connect through music and through dance. So that's how we do it, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the hoop dance. Yeah. And how you learned that is, I think, it's a very compelling story, if you don't mind sharing it. Yeah, I can tell a little bit about it. Yesterday, you know, we flew into Newark, and then I was thinking about that. We flew right over the Statue of Liberty there, and that's where I was in uh, 1980. My buddy, who who was a really, like, I think the best hoop dancer on the planet at that time, you know, we were doing some shows at Liberty Park, and so that's where we were. We call each other brother. And his name was Arlo Goodbear from uh, Shell Creek, North Dakota. That's on the Fort Berthold Reservation. So he said, brother, he says, uh, this hoop dance that I have here, he says, I'm going to give this dance to you. He was a joker. He liked to tease. So I thought he was just setting me up for a joke now. But I looked at him and he, he said, I'm serious. No, I'm going to give you four lessons. He said, I'm going to give you one lesson now and I'll give you the rest later. He said, I'm going to do my part and you do your part. He says, and he says, when you do your part, he says, through this dance, you're going to meet many people, see many places, have many wonderful experiences, and receive just abundant blessings. He said, you'll get all that if you do your part, he said, but I'll do my part. He just had his hoops there, and he, uh, he broke them out, and he just showed me a few designs. Maybe it took 10 minutes at the most, and he had me repeat them. The next day, we took off back out west. Not too many days after that, then... I got a call from his family. They told me that he had died and that they wanted me to be one of the pallbearers. So then I, I did that. And uh, interestingly, uh, his brother gave me his hoops that he used, just gave them to me. You know, I didn't ask why. He just, he just came over and handed them to me when I, was at, when I was at the funeral. But the hoop dance is so complicated. How did you learn it? Shortly after that, I had a series of dreams. Basically, what I saw in these dreams was that I'd see him dancing. I'll give an example. Like I'd see him dancing, it was dark. But then I'd hear the music, and I could see him dancing, and there was a little bit of light there. I could see him. And as he would dance, he began to create designs. And when he made the designs, the light would come out. It would, that light would expand. And I could see the people gathered all around there, but they were all just so downcast, so downtrodden, and so sad, and so uh, heartbroken. You could see the way they carried themselves. It was, it was like that. But then when he began to create designs with the hoop. The hoop, of course, is, it's, again, it's a universal archetype. It represents all good things, you know, peace and unity, harmony, balance, beauty, continuity, eternity, everything good is conveyed by the symbology of the hoop. So when he b began to dance with that, he began to create designs, like designs of springtime, like flowers, trees, birds, butterflies, animals, stars, everything, see? Then when he'd make a design like flowers, then I could see in the people the capacity that we all have to blossom, you see, to bring forth color, to bring beauty, to bring blessings. Now, there was no language that I was hearing. It was just images. It was visualizations that I could see in my dream. And so then, after a series of dreams that I had, it ended like that. Then I recalled what he had said, you know, that he would continue the lessons. He'd give me four lessons. And then I realized... He did his part. <laughs> he did his part. Now it was up to me. But then so I didn't know what to do. And then interestingly, uh, he had obligated himself to go on this eight-week USIS, the State Department tour, U.S. Information Service tour to Africa. So then uh, after he died, well, they asked his mother if she could recommend somebody to go in her son's place. So then she said, well, take my other son. She meant me. It's just the way they are. The elders are, and we're that way too. He says, take my other son. He can do it. And so then they asked me, but I knew I couldn't take his place because I, I didn't know what to do. Okay, I said, well, okay, I'll try. I'll try to take his place. That's all I could say. I couldn't say I could do it. I didn't want to say I couldn't do it. So anyway, I went on that tour, and then uh, the first place we went was to Dakar. And so the rest of the group, they're all going around. They were trying to, I guess they gave him a little decompression time for jet lag. But I practice, practice, practice. You know what? Because the dreams that he gave me, they were not instructional. They weren't recipes how to do the dance. They just told me the meaning behind it. See, that's all I got out of that. And the patterns. The patterns. Yeah, I could see those. The storyline, I got that. So that's what I was trying to replicate. But then, see, we did, uh, we were doing like two, three presentations per day for uh, two months, really. 
I'm sure at the beginning I was just awful, you see. But then after a few days, I started to get a little pattern going, and I started to add on, add on. And so after about a few months, I started to have a little nice little routine going. So I just kept on adding on to that, see. So that was really fortuitous that I started over there. And I'm sure it was all part of some big plan that going on that I wasn't aware of. But everything he did predict, it came to pass. Since that time, 35 years ago now, really I've been able to tour and perform in I think it's over 80 countries. When did you begin to bring the Lakota language, stories, songs, dance into the classroom? I was enlisted in Teacher Corps, which was, you know, one of the great society programs. It was to develop teachers from the local community to work on the reservation area. So then that was to the University of North Dakota. And I found that I was very poor in classroom management. And I'm still that way. I'm very poor disciplinarian, very um, lax in that regard. So then what I found, the way I would engage the kids is I would get them involved in different music and dance, and I just used the arts to do that. I think around 1979, the Arts Council there, uh, now this would would have been the South Dakota Arts Council, they didn't have any tribal people on their artist roster to offer programs for the schools. So then they approached me and asked me if I could do some presentations, and I said, yeah. So I officially became part of the uh, roster of the South Dakota Arts Council. And then I used to do a lot of artists in the schools presentations. And so eventually it just got to the point where even though I was initially a full-time teacher and then I became a school administrator, since about 84, I've just been freelancing. I say like self-unemployed, but doing a lot of school programs. And so I've been been doing that since then. You've developed a curriculum. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to uh, revitalize the flute, the traditional flute. Around 1980, there was a gentleman who was making the traditional tuned flutes, but he found that they were not commercially viable. So then they started making these flutes on a minor pentatonic scale. It's called the melodic scale. That's not a traditional tuned instrument. It's a very modern creation. But everybody thinks that that flute, that tuning system, has some relationship to uh, native North American musical aesthetic. But it doesn't, you see. It doesn't. So meanwhile, the traditional tuning system kind of died out. And there's really only like one guy I know of that makes traditional flutes. Anyway, what we decided to do was to introduce this traditional tuning system. And so we developed a curriculum and the the flutes that we make. We make the flutes with the kids. And so I've been making hundreds and maybe it's been thousands now in the schools. And the flutes are very versatile because you can get the traditional like Lakota or Meskwaki or any Kiowa tuning system in there. But you can also play... The chromatic scale, full chromatic scale, it's really versatile. You can play the full diatonic scale and two pentatonic scales. Yeah. You had a screening of a video recently in Washington, D.C. Yeah, oh yeah. It's called Rising Voices. It'll have a national release very soon. And it's a, uh, it's a documentation on the uh, Lakota Revitalization Initiative. Uh, I think a lot of the listeners or whoever's listening to this know that there's currently 140 tribal languages spoken in the United States. And within a generation, it's predicted that that will be down to probably a dozen to 15 because of the fast attrition now. Where there's a, Wait, you're saying it'll be reduced by a dozen or reduced to a reduced dozen? Reduced down to about 12 Whoa. because it's very fast because now like every month practically there are languages dying out. We have one language in North Dakota, it's Mandan, you know, the language that uh, Lewis and Clark, yeah. in that there's only one speaker left, one fluent native speaker left. Uh, Arikara, there's basically no fluent speakers. There's a lot of people who, who grew up with it, but they maybe lack the confidence to converse in it. So th- these languages are just dying out at a very rapid rate now. There's just a few that have potential to be stabilized, and Lakota is one of them. And we have so many speakers, Lakota, that we could actually, you know, revitalize it. And so this is what this documentary is about. It's a situation that's happening all over the world, but just happens that the United States is one of the most critical places of uh, language loss on the planet right now. Are you finding that the younger generations are interested in, in these traditions? Yes. I see this for Lakota. It's young people who are educated, very intellectually gifted, who have the capacity 
and uh, the willpower to do this. Most of the native speakers would be like in their 60s and 70s, and so a lot of them, you know, even though they're actively speaking the language, they may not have the drive or initiative to really uh, spearhead it, whereas the younger people do. Yeah. Yeah. We're sitting here in the Library of Congress and getting ready for the 2015 National Heritage Awards, and of course, you were a recipient in 1990, I believe. Yes. I'd like you to just share your thoughts about the National Heritage Award and and what it means to have an award like that in the United States. Oh, it's fantastic because, you know, the United States is noted all over as being so much into development and putting the past behind itself. And I think it's such a great thing that this award is, is receiving more and more attention and the awardees are receiving more recognition. And so I'm I'm really excited to be a part of it. And again, the whole idea behind it for me is that this focuses on these traditions that connect all people throughout the world. You know, there are so many art forms or forms of expression that are just passing. You know, they'll have popularity maybe now, but they'll soon be forgotten. But these traditional arts, they have continuity. So they connect us all the way back to the to the past. And I think there's more and more uh, awareness of the imperative, the need to make these connections now throughout the world. I think about that when you when you do your hoop dance yeah. because you have 24 hoops. Yeah, usually it's 28, yeah. Or 28, yeah. but then by the end, yeah. it's one pattern. Yes. It becomes one. Yeah, yeah. I think it's underlying vision that the Lakota people have. See, in our language, when we talk about uh, socio-political groupings or ethnicities, we say, Oyate Trachangaleshka, the hoop of the nation. It's just a way of describing peoples. And so the, the vision is that the, the people, the, like the Lakota people in the future will be one of many hoops, you see, that will form one great design, one great hoop of unity in the world. And so that we all have something beautiful to contribute to an emerging global civilization. So we, each, uh, each of these diverse peoples in the country, uh, in the world really, has some unique, special gift which is so much contained in these individuals that, that are the recipients, you see, of the Heritage Award. And so then uh, it, it just gives you that hope, that realization that it's possible that we can offer these gifts and thereby empower one another to achieve that destiny. And from there, just to soar off as a collective human family. And there we'll leave it. Kevin Locke, thank you so much. All right, you bet. That is Lakota flute player, hoop dancer, and 1990 National Heritage Fellow, Kevin Locke. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog, or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.